My name is Renata von Scharner. I'm with the Charles River Conservancy and this is the Charles River Conservancy Parkland Show. Talking about the parklands, the river, and today we're going to talk uh, about the river and the bridges and the parklands in a very special light. Because <laughs> we have a light expert here with us. Our guest today is Susan Seitinger. Welcome. Thank you very much, Renata. Susan is the City Innovations Manager at Philips Lighting. So you are a lighting person. And while you were a postdoc at MIT, um, at the Media Lab, you were at the Fluid Interfaces Group, yep. and you produced some artwork there yep. um, on the river. Very exciting project. Um, on the bridge, on the MIT bridge or the Harvard, Harvard bridge. It's really the Mass Avenue bridge. I think it has we'll many... We'll keep it neutral that way, neutral. right? <laughs> That's right. Keep it the Mass Avenue bridge. And it was part of the 150th anniversary um, of MIT. So, as you know, this show is always about um, different aspects of the river. And it's wonderful when an uh, institution that is right on the river and artists of that mm. institution choose to celebrate mm. the river, um, celebrate the bridges, the special um, reflective qualities of the yeah. light on the river. Yeah. And because I, for me, art always makes me see things differently. And I mm -hmm. think that's the goal of many artists and many of the examples you will show um, succeeded in doing that, of making a sea the river in a different way. Yeah. So we are um, looking at the river here, we're looking at the bridge where the river is the thickest, the Mass Avenue bridge, and we are um, going there and see what happened during the festival um, at the 150th anniversary. So Suzanne, tell us what we're looking at. Um, this looks like a, a poster. Right, this was the cover of the Boston Globe magazine celebrating the MIT 150th anniversary, which was celebrated last year from uh, January 7th through June 5th, and 150 last year, days. Yep. That last year was the year 2011, 2011. Exactly. all right. So celebrating the 1861 founding of the Institute and it was 150 days of celebrations that uh, went on and that were accompanied by what was called FAST. And FAST stands for Festival of Art, Science and Technology, which was the brainchild of Professor Todd Macover, who is based at the MIT Media Lab, mm -hmm. uh, an amazing artist and a composer. And it was really his vision to bring together artists and scientists from across the Institute and try to create what really is the essence of MIT, uh, namely where art and science meet, where, where these two things come together and come up with totally new and unprecedented things. Mm -hmm. And so What's important to think about is how, you know, what does that mean? What kinds of installations, what kinds of experiences can, can these partnerships really lead to? And the culmination of the FAST Festival, which went on throughout the celebrations, was FAST Light, which was the Festival of Art, Science and Technology through light, through installations, through art and architecture and design. And Mi Jin Yoon was one of the curators of that festival, and she's a professor in the architecture department at MIT, and you can see behind the website here of the festival, uh, Mijin's Light Drift Project, which was exhibited um, at um, on the Charles River, 90 of these floating um, buoys, really, in, in sort of ref pods, pods, pods yeah. Yes. I mean, she's refer she refers to buoys and kind of this idea of floating things in water as an inspiration for her installation. And they're all, of course, augmented by light. So they um, change color within this palette of blue and green. There's 90 of these pods. And and they're uh, importantly, uh, they're interactive. So the pods on the uh, bank side, so the pods where people can sit, are actually chairs that are interactive. So they have sensors on them that know when someone is sitting on them. And then they communicate via radio frequency with the pods in the water. And that generates different kinds of effects. So what the idea behind that is, is to encourage people to interact with each other, with the installation, uh, and really try to make the installation do certain things. So the idea is an exploratory mode or to get people into this exploratory mode 
uh, and try to think about that relationship between what's in the water, what's on the riverbank, and how those two things might meet. Yeah, and, and it um, was normally at night when you go by this location, it's quite dark, obviously yeah. the water is black, and during those two days when Memorial Drive was closed, suddenly this part in front of MIT yeah. became alive with thousands, tens of thousands of people um, strolling. And, and it was a very playful experience. And it really brought out a, a whole different part of the river. There were a whole series of other examples um, Right. that we have a poster here. Maybe you can explain some of those to us here. Right, so um, among the, the MIT um, FAST Festival kind of committee members, which was really a host of people from uh, MIT Planning, Kelly Brown, through the uh, MIT Arts Council and, and Arts um, Group, uh, Leela Kinney, uh, including um, Mi Jin Yoon and Todd Macover and uh, the producer, Meg Rotzel, they basically brought together 20 different artists from across the universe from across the institute who created different installations and here you can see some for example uh, the rockers that Sheila Kennedy created that are solar powered and that That's have lighting the top inside. Lift. Yep, exactly. Yep. In the center in Killian Court you have uh, Otto Pina's uh, inflated sculpture which was also uh, created as a, as a community experience really with, with many many volunteers uh, involved in that. Uh, underneath it you can see collaboration between Nader Tarani and uh, Gediminas Urbonas who's in the uh, uh, now ACT Arts Culture and Technology Program, the Art Dep Arts uh, Group, and he um, was he was on that program too. Oh, so right. if you want to see the, the show oh, uh, with him, you can go to YouTube where this show will also be. So um, he he spoke on this program as oh, well. Oh great! Oh wonderful! Yeah. So they they use this um, this archive really to to kind of project out onto the water again. So really the idea was to. Um, create something that would engage with the water, engage with the bank, river bank, engage with the campus, and draw people throughout the whole area. So explain a little bit the, the piece in the middle. Uh, mm -hmm. it was, it's a large, um, it's a, it's float. a, a yeah. float, it's mm -hmm. a sculpture that yep. served like a canvas. Exactly, so there were projections that, so it was a, an inflated three-dimensional sculpture that was floating in the river on a barge, and there were very powerful projectors on um, the side of the of the river that were um, projecting different content onto this onto the structure, and these the content was inspired by archival material from MIT, and so it was really meant to be a you know, floating archive memory mm. barge, really. Of, of and the then river. we will now be looking at uh, later on at at the bridge that you exactly. were involved right. in. Um, so let's um, step back a little bit. This mm -hmm. was a, a celebration of, of the founding of MIT, yep. but actually um, MIT was not founded uh, where it is now. It was exactly. founded in Boston and it came across the river. <laughs> exactly, it floated, literally, right? It floated, um, across, they floated the river. across the river. across the river. Almost a thousand MIT students and professors assembled um, as part of a festival called the Mask of Power, where they floated on a barge across the river to inaugurate the new campus uh, in 1916. They came from the back bay. They came from the back bay, exactly, and, and floated over to Cambridge. Um, they alighted there and then um, proceeded to engage in this in this festival, which was was choreographed down to the last um, you know element and included a whole number of special effects we could say so what you can see here uh, on the top of the of the dome building is a searchlight a large searchlight which was actually borrowed from a navy ship that was harbored at the time in in the city and the two searchlights there was this searchlight and another one in the Boston location and the two searchlights were crossing uh, right over the Charles River and as the festival came to a close the two searchlights Light separated and the one in Boston uh, was extinguished as a symbolic kind of a show and, and, and representation of, of what, what it meant to actually move over to Cambridge. And so this was really important and I, I find it really telling that the campus was inaugurated with light 
and it was celebrated again through light. So this theme of light uh, being something that's important to engineers as, an art, as a mode of artistic expression, I think, became just organically bubbled up again in the, in the 150th celebration. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention uh, what might be the first Dance Dance Revolution floor ever, which was a, a floor lit from below with colored lights uh, and dancers up above uh, and also mist um, machines Coming that up. were also um, that also where the mist was being lit with colorful light. So it was really quite an extravaganza. And that was in 1916. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we had to top that, right? Which exactly. is hard. <laughs> well, you definitely um, contributed to that, to that drama. Um, you picked a very long <laughs> <laughs> exactly. site. Um, you picked the bridge. Yeah. And um, tell us a little bit of how, how this idea came about. Mm. Um, because um, lighting a bridge that is almost 1400 well it's 1800 feet long, long. and and we uh, illuminated 1400 feet of those 1800 feet um, when we were thinking about this uh, in early September 2010 um, the thought was how are we going to um, express something meaningful to the community to MIT um, that that really will will enhance this entire uh, festival through light we thought a lot about um, buildings that were facing the riverfront, so some of the dormitories, some of the um, educational buildings, and trying to see, can we do things there um, with windows or with light in windows and all these things. And then eventually we sort of hone in on the bridge as this amazing um, connector, really, between what was uh, the old site, of the old campus, the new campus, um, what is the, the, the sort of everyday sort of daily route for many students and faculty at MIT, it's not to mention the residents. Smooth, the smooth, the smooth bridge, of course, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so there's a lot of different things that make the bridge important to the MIT community and to the greater regional community. And so it became an, an interesting problem to think through what, what would it mean to activate that bridge to make it a reflection of that activity. So I worked uh, with Paul Pla, who's a, a graduate student at the Fluid Interfaces Group at the MIT Media Lab. And we collaborated to think about how we could create an interactive experience that would be meaningful to people. And so what we wanted to do was have the activity uh, of that walking of the passersby going back and forth across the bridge be reflected in uh, a light display that we wanted to be um, some sort of um, so low resolution. The idea wasn't to create a screen. It wasn't to create um, a sort of video content running across the bridge. But the idea was to give a, a sense of presence, a sense mm -hmm. of experience um, that is low resolution. And, and that's what we ended up doing. All right. Um, let's, so let's take a look. Let's, right? let's um, have a look at, at the so this is uh, a view from the uh, Cambridge side looking across towards Boston and you can see on the right hand side uh, the bridge uh, and and the wonderful reflection Renata mm. that you referred to before I mean really was just such a bonus I mean what an amazing opportunity to be able to have water uh, underneath your light installation you basically get two for one right yeah that's what <laughs> the, the French painter Gauguin he said right when you you mean when you paint water you get twice as much light, you get twice <laughs> as much. True. Sometimes it also doubles the cost in, in, <laughs> as in real estate or in, in, and it right. makes some permitting issues more complicated. But you, had, you didn't have to worry about too much about that, but you um, had the, the reflection. Yeah, exactly. We had the reflection and, and you can see we worked hard, you know, to, to kind of announce to people that this was going to be happening. We worked really closely with the Department of Conservation and Recreation at the state. Um, Kathy Winter collaborated with folks at the MIT Planning Department, Kelly Brown, uh, an amazing group of people. Paul Murphy, just amazing team. I mean, the, the they, they really made it happen and this was not easy. There were lots of moving parts, lots of things going on, lots of volunteers. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later but mm. it was uh, a lot to get it done for this um, for this big event um, and so you can see in the next image for example this is how we rolled out the installation um, we'll get into the details of the of the diffuser system that we designed in a, in a little bit but you uh, you can see here how we had segments basically of of lights that were bundled together that we then uh, worked with teams of volunteers to to uh, mount and so um, you can see here the generator which actually powered the installation so it was difficult you know difficult to tap into power on the 
on the bridge itself. And so we needed, uh, this is Fernando Mato, who's now one of my colleagues at Philips Color Kinetics, an uh, amazing engineer uh, and, and, and integrator who helped us get all the parts in, in place at the end. Um, this is uh, cutting the diffusers. Uh, so we set settled on um, acrylic diffusers uh, which were four, um, had four LED lights inside, and we'll get into the details of the lights in just a second. Wait, go back for just a second. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you can just see here that we um, we settled on these because what we wanted to do was spread the light out mm -hmm. across the railing. So think about how you might do that. And, and so what we did is we inserted the LEDs inside these tubes and had them pointing up and down. And so that kind of created almost like a lava-like lamp effect. So where rather than just have having dots exactly. there. You want it exactly. to spread it. Yes. And more importantly, we wanted it to be 360 visible. So we wanted people on the bridge to have an experience as well as people looking at it from a distance. So there's two very different scales because one is an intimate scale and the other is more of a monumental kind of large uh, gesture across the landscape. And so we had to work between those two scales and um, work with Derek Cassio, for example, at, at, at Philips Color Kinetics, the industrial designer there, who also helped us and Jonathan Levy to think through how we might do that um, quickly and easily. And there you can see Kurt Kevill, who was one of the volunteers who worked really, really hard to help us get all of this in place. Um, and so, yeah, so you can see on the next uh, image is where we do have all the numbers. So there were a lot of pieces that had to come, um, that had to work um, uh, in order for the, all of this to come together. We had 9,600 LED nodes. So really importantly, um, Philips uh, Color Kinetics um, uh, provided those LED mm. nodes for us. I have to just an amazing word of thanks to to Jeff Cassis, um, Paul Kennedy, the head of engineering there, John Warwick, Fernando Mato, and a whole slew of, um, of volunteers who also came out when we were actually doing the installation. So it was really extraordinary effort on their part and and just very generous support. So we use those LED nodes to the very you know to the very we try to really get as much out of them as possible and and that turned into a 1,400 foot long display wow. that. Right, um, that's, you're right getting across. making us very <laughs> anxious to see. So here's some more uh, images of that. It gives you a sense of how we try to play with the spacing. So. It's more, you can't really see it in great detail on top, but you can get a sense that it's much denser on the Cambridge side. We wanted to emphasize the Cambridge side and also play a little bit with perspective. So when you're standing there, it almost looks like it's evenly spaced across the whole oh, bridge yeah. because of the perspective. Um, so it was a fun added bonus there. And we really wanted to make this railing into an active, into an interactive piece. So, so explain you, what the right. interactivity right. is, so what happens. Next, if you go to the next, you'll see some of the sensors we used. Um, we had 400 passive infrared sensors all across the bridge and um, had to have to really thank um, SparkFun Electronics and, and Panasonic who uh, helped us both with uh, the hardware and the sensors. So they were a supporter and then um, what these um, elements here are, are the main nodes with the sensor nodes. So we had about 400 of these spread out across the bridge and they would sense people walking by. So they're not really tracking necessarily which, how many people are there, but they give you an impression so of they the activity can, they level. Can, they, can, exactly. they can sense the movement. Exactly. And then what happens, What? how did they translate the movement? So that was then an abstract translation into the light patterns that were happening on the bridge. So early on, Paul and I talked a lot about how we wanted this to be be more of an emergent type of light display rather than something that would be canned show, you know, where you know ahead of time, okay, it's going to be red, it's going to be green, it's going to be blue. We wanted it to be emergent so that every time would be different. So random. Random. Well, not random, but let's say generative. So that it, it would, would, it would it be would generated. Unexpected. Unexpected, exactly. Surprising uh, and, so, and reflective of the activity. So, so more people if there more, were more people would, would more light bubbles color. exactly more light bubbles we had different modes so we had some where you would just have more sort of elements floating in the on the display we'd have others where it was cumulative so it would count up so you would sort of see if more people were going one way or the other mm -hmm. um, so we tried these different things and that was really successful and really fun uh, to play with this was just an uh, early on explorations where we were trying to see how would you do this to kind of have guiding light uh, this is just a rendering but if yeah. you go to the next when you can start to see some of these oh, images. Yeah. So we can see here too this idea that we wanted something that would be visible to the people on the bridge itself so that people who were um, standing there had an experience that was exciting, visually exciting, but that you would also see from a distance something, you know, interesting. So yeah, we can just flip through some of these images. And so there you, were... Yeah. Go ahead. 
And so he, here, oh, and it, it right. changes here. Exactly. So, so yeah, so you can see how some of these uh, color shifts were taking place. Um, yep. And this one here should show exactly how these bubbles started to follow people as they were walking across um, the bridge. So it must be a bit spooky when you walk over the bridge and the light follows you. <laughs> the light follows you, yeah. yeah. So this is interesting, right, because it starts to change the relationship between people and the infrastructures that are around them. Their expectations for what things uh, might happen start to uh, change, and that's quite interesting shall we, with, with kind of how uh, technologies are, are um, transforming and becoming more interactive yeah. in urban environments. And this is a last view of a, from a distance, more with a more traditional uh, light display of a rainbow, where you can see the more monumental gesture. And in the front, you can see uh, light drift by Mijin and then the barge with the floating sculpture. And it really was just thousands of people. What was amazing, it was a Saturday and a Sunday night. And the second evening, there were many people who came back with cameras explicitly just to take photographs of this whole ensemble. Because really what you can see is that the bridge frames the rest of the of the installations. And so it's really a, a complete set of, of pieces. And mm. that, I think, was particularly successful. And I don't know if any of us anticipated just how successful that ensemble would be, because it was a lot more powerful that way and you have a sort of a line of light that outlines the whole yeah yeah area. well I I have very good memories of that night oh. and I didn't know you were involved but when I saw your presentation <laughs> at the Institute right. of Human Centered Design uh, I realized that you know it, it is enormous talent and to apply light to urbanity I mm -hmm. think this is a, a subject yeah that interests me greatly yeah. um, because mm. particularly in, in, a, in a season like in the winter, in the winter you <laughs> yeah. know, light can really bring the parklands alive and mm -hmm. the river alive. Yes. And, and also when, when I saw your presentation, I thought, oh, lights could also be used for underpasses. Absolutely. And uh, talked on this show quite a bit about underpasses and you might have seen this oh, image oh, that's one still the last one last one, one last I should thing. remember to just uh, also thank the amazing team of um, MIT undergrads who worked on the software that we created custom for this uh, installation I mean Russell Cohen was extraordinary Eugene Andrew Dave Dan and and, and David it was really quite the quite the um, it sounds like quite effort. a team. Yes. yes quite a team the dream team yes so I want to now um, take our viewers to a different application mm -hmm. of light, yeah. what light can do along the river. And so I have this picture of uh, a rendering mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. underpass um, on the Anderson Bridge, the Anderson Memorial Bridge, mm -hmm. where the Charles River Conservancy is working with Mass DOT to create underpasses. And I think underpasses are a great way to apply light. Um, here is just to show that an underpass doesn't have to be dark. But then you came up <laughs> with some images um, from other places around the world um, where light was used um, for underpasses, tunnels, passages. Maybe you want to tell us uh, yeah. what, where these examples come from. So this is the Clink Street Tunnel in Southwark um, in London, uh, just near the uh, Tate Modern. It was done by um, Halo Lighting and uh, lighting designer Jan Guenancia together with Architainment. And they wanted to, the council actually, it was the vision of the council to take these old Victorian railroad uh, viaducts and transform them into something gorgeous and spectacular. Yeah. And that's exactly what they've done here. They've taken and um, an idea that really came from a nightclub where they had already, where this designer had created a, a fireworks display on the ceiling yeah. and they transposed it to this environment. And now when people walk through here, they're going through a safe, comfortable environment and at the same time being delighted by something completely surprising yeah. and enticing. This is a different example from another part of London, it, which is the... Uh, Regent's Canal in Islington and what the council here wanted what they wanted to do was liven up this very important 
pedestrian and cycling connector under this tunnel, which you can imagine without the light would be quite foreboding. Yeah. And what they did is made a responsive system. So here on the left where the white light is, it actually goes to a warmer color temperature, so more yellowy, more incandescent bulb-like and when no one is there it goes to a more cool kind of um, bluish tint <laughs> so it and gives you a warm welcome exactly it gives you uh, a warm welcome and yeah you have other examples where the light changes as right. you move through the space so this is an art uh, installation that was commissioned as part of the london design week that just very recently in september of 2012 and it was done by cinemod studio and dominic harris and they used this art installation as, and this tunnel connector as an opportunity to really th have people think critically about what we were asking before, namely this idea of light, um, light following you in the city. Here, the track in the middle is actually has these white lights attached to it that follow a person, and in front of the person is one color, and behind the person is another color. Mm. So this is an, an art installation. It's a critical yeah. you know, uh, exploration of what it means to have infrastructures be responsive to yeah, people. Yeah. Um, so in fact, um, these underpasses, rather than being just a place where you want to go through because you want to avoid traffic yeah. or you want to bike, it could actually become a destination. Exactly. It could be a place that you want to yes. seek out and where yeah. you could have artistic expression. Yeah. Yep, exactly. I know you have many more examples, so <laughs> let's go through some of them. Um, and just to, gi to give just some, briefly, because yeah, we have very little time them. left. Just flip through them. Jason Bruges in Sunderland Station in London, uh, another art installation. Interactive. Um, here again, the light following people through connectors in London. Yeah. Another, yeah, another view of that. Again, Jason Bruges studio. And then moving the to a whole fountain. different scale. Yeah. But we are almost. I think. Yeah. I, think I think we, we cannot. We cannot really go through um, that yeah. because I want to make sure. That, yeah, um, let's just go through. Yeah. Um, that you people know how to get hold of you, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, and so I'm yeah. gonna put up this image. Great. So this is Suzanne's information um, at uh, both at the Media Lab at MIT as well as at Philips um, Color Kinetics, and I want to thank you for thank you. for coming to the show and, and sharing this um, concept with us. Thank and you. I hope our viewers will see the river in a different way. And I, you can find this show on YouTube and, and go to the websites we gave you. And here thank is you. more information. And thank you very much for coming to the show and sharing this information with us. Thank you, Renata. Thank really you very much. Thank you very much. It was a great time.